Good morning, Grace Evergreen. How are you doing? All right. Um, I, I'm excited. We're going to wrap up this morning uh, the book of Jonah, and next week Rick is going to be kicking off our new series in the book of Ruth, so I'm looking forward to that. I'll be catching that online, uh, but eagerly anticipating it. Uh, this morning we're going to be in the book of Jonah, chapter 4, and so you can go ahead there and open up in your Bibles if you have them. Um, and here, has, here is what God has been teaching us through the book of Jonah in the last few weeks. It teaches us that we are Jonah. See, in word and in thought and in deed, we are reluctant followers of God who flee from him every day, but God pursues us. Although we are not always faithful, God is faithful. And just as God called Jonah to go to Nineveh to share a message with a people who did not know God, we also have been called to share the message of Jesus with those around us. Uh, but unlike Jonah, we're, we haven't been called to a, a distant land or to a people who are far away, but we have been called to, to this place. We've been called to deliver a message from God to the people who live and work and raise their families right alongside us. Uh, and so for those of us who are part of this church, who have submitted our lives to God, God has made us missionaries to this part of the city so that we would not focus on our own comfort or our own way of doing things, but instead that we would focus outward and would constantly move forward in figuring out what new doors God is opening today to reach people in our area with the gospel. And so for us this morning, it's almost as if the word of God has also come to us as it did to Jonah, saying, arise and go to the area around Evergreen and Willow Grove, and Aspen Ridge, and University Heights, and call out to it that they might hear the gospel and give their lives over to Jesus and be saved. Uh, but this book also isn't just about us and what we need to do. It's a book about God and what he has done. Uh, God is the one who sets everything in motion from uh, storms and the feeding habits of oversized fish and changing people's hearts and down to the movement of the tiniest worm or the blowing of the hot Middle Eastern breeze. In the book of Jonah, we see how God sets the standard. God initiates. God shows his faithfulness. God is an incredibly good and gracious Lord. If our time in Jonah is going to be faithful to what the Bible says, then we need to see how everything in this book is 100% God-centered and then live in light of that. So with that in mind, we're going to watch a video reading of our scripture passage this morning, and then I'm going to pray, and then let's get to work. Reading from Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? and also much cattle? Father God, thank you for your graciousness and compassion towards us. Thank you that the same pursuing, amazing love that you showed to the Ninevites 
you also show to us. None of us is without need of your mercy. None of us can stand here and say that we can stand righteous before you on our own merits. But God, you have been so gracious and so kind towards us. You have chased us down even when we weren't seeking you out. You gave your son to die on the cross in our place for our sins. Perfectness, perfection and righteousness and holiness put to death so that the sinful and the shameful and the wicked could be made clean. Because that's the kind of God that you are. And so God, help me this morning as I preach this message to point forward not not to who we should be or to who Jonah is, but to who you are and how amazing it is that we get to know you because you have revealed yourself to us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. In uh, 1987, a man named Gordon Wilson and his daughter Marie were attending a Remembrance Day parade in their hometown of Enniskillen in Northern Ireland. Gordon was a strong Christian and he worked as a draper and his daughter Marie was 20 year old, years old and was just starting out her career as a nurse. What they didn't know is that as they were celebrating, um, what they didn't know as they were celebrating was that members of the IRA, which was a resistance group against British control of Ireland, uh, that wanted to end British rule and bring about an independent socialist republic encompassing all of Ireland, members of the IRA were busy planting bombs at the Remembrance Day parade that Gordon and Marie were attending. In the middle of the celebrations, the bombs went off. Gordon and his daughter were buried under, underneath the rebel together. A collapsed wall lay on them. The thick dust from the debris filled the air and got caught in their lungs. Panicked and terrified cries filled their ears. They could taste their own blood. Their bodies were filled with pain. Hours later, Gordon and his daughter were both pulled from the rubble. Gordon was taken to the, to to the hospital to recover. Marie was unresponsive, but she was also taken to the hospital where she died. When the BBC came in to interview the survivors, Gordon Wilson said this about what he had experienced. He said, We were both thrown forward, rubble and stones and whatever, in and around and over us and under us. I was aware of a pain in my right shoulder. I shouted to Marie, was she all right? And she said, yes. She found my hand and she said, is that your hand, Dad? Now remember, we were under six foot of rubble. I said, are you all right? And she said, yes, but she was shouting in between. Three or four times I asked her, and she always said, yes, she was all right. When I asked her the fifth time, are you all right, Marie? She said, Daddy, I love you very much. And those were the last words that she spoke to me. But to the astonishment of his listeners, Wilson went on to add this. He said, but I bear no ill will. I bear no grudge. Bitter sort of talk is not going to bring her back to life. I shall pray tonight and every night for the men who did this, that God will forgive them. No words in more than 25 years of violence in Northern Ireland had, a, had such a powerful emotional impact. His grace towered over the miserable justification of the bombers. A later Irish president, Irish president remembered the words of Gordon Wilson this way. She said, Gordon's words shamed us all and caught us off guard. They sounded so different from what we had all become used to. They brought a stillness with them. They carried a sense of the transcendent into a place that had become so ugly we could hardly bear to watch. A year after the Inneskill bombing, on the anniversary of the terrible events that had happened there, Wilson held an event to commemorate the lives that had been lost. At that event, he publicly invited members of the IRA to come and meet with him. He invited news crews to show up. And because of his faith in Jesus Christ, 
he publicly announced that he forgave his daughter's murderers. He begged the IRA to stop the violence and these tactics to forward their agenda. Wilson went on to become internationally known as a peace campaigner, and he was even nominated by Irish President Albert Reynolds to become a senator. But he also had his detractors. Uh, some people would write to him, how dare you forgive? What kind of father are you who can forgive your daughter's killers? See, for some of it, for some people, it was as if offering love and forgiveness was a sign of mental weakness instead of what it really was, a, a mark of incredible spiritual strength. See, grace is a wonderful concept that we all love. And people name their daughters grace, and we sing songs about grace, and even our church is called grace. But grace and compassion towards those who don't seem to deserve it is still an incredibly scandalous thing. And that's where we find ourselves at the beginning of the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah. The first things, thing that we notice is that God has compassion on the wicked. So read with me, actually, the last verse of uh, chapter 3. And then we're going to do uh, the first two verses of chapter 4. So chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw how the Ninevites repented, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Literally, um, it was a great evil, according to Jonah. And he was angry. Verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He's saying it almost as an accusation. And then skip down to the end with me, uh, verse 11. God says in response to Jonah, Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? and also much cattle. Uh, in chapter 3, by the way, uh, the whole city repented, and not only did they uh, decide that they would, um, they would fast, but they also made the animals fast. So it's almost like God is thinking, oh, you know, that's, that's cute, right? You know, there's, there's uh, 120,000 people, and also the cows. Um, I, I, I like maybe the sense of humor that God has there. Um, so notice the scandal of grace here. See, when Jonah saw that God had forgiven Nineveh and spared them from destruction, the footnote in Jonah 4 verse 1 in the ESV says the literal translation is, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. The Assyrians, which was the name of the people who lived at Nineveh, they were known throughout the world for their cruelty to others. See, they would dismember their enemies. They would take captives and skin them alive and they would brag about it. The reason that we know these things are true is because they had scenes of them doing this engraved on the doors of their palaces where archaeologists discovered them, and the Assyrians did this so that they could be surrounded by reminders of how cruel and dominant they could be and how powerful they were over other nations of the world. They bragged about it, and they surrounded themselves with reminders that they were this way. And God, you want to forgive these people? These people are sinners. These people are wicked. These people are cruel and hateful. They're oppressors. God, what kind of God are you who can forgive sinners and killers? The answer is that God looks on even the worst people, and he has compassion. And he lists some reasons for his compassion here. So first, God gives them compassion because they respond to his correction. Uh, read Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Um, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the, of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So he gives them compassion because they respond. Second, God gives them compassion because they don't know any better. The the last verse of uh, Jonah chapter 4 says, Shouldn't I pity Nineveh, um, who does not know their right hand from their left? Um, they don't know their right hand from their left. That's a way of saying that they're confused. They're in the dark. They've grown up their entire lives in a society that has trained them to be this way since they were children. 
And third, God gives them compassion because they're helpless. When he tells Jonah they don't know their right hand from their left, he means that they're in the dark. They're helpless to actually get any better on their own. They need help, and that's why God has sent Jonah to them. And fourth, God shows them compassion because that is who he is. Read uh, Jonah 4 verse 2. Jonah complains to God. I know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah here is quoting Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, which is sort of like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. This is, is where God gives the closest thing to a definition of who he is. And the first thing that it says is that God is merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. By the way, these are great uh, categories for why we should be compassionate too. So following God's example, we should show compassion to people who are trying which means we should help them in their efforts to, to help them move in a positive direction. Two, we should follow God's example by showing compassion to those who don't know what they're doing. That means that we, we reason and we educate and we relate and we model a better way and we train and we show patience even when someone's lack of understanding causes them to lash out. And three, we, as we follow God, we should show compassion to people who are helpless. See, people can be stuck in a bad spot for all kinds of reasons and unable to help themselves. And so they need assistance. They need financial or material assistance. Or they need physical assistance, like how we help someone carry something when they can't do it on their own. They might need emotional or psychological assistance where they need help processing and, and sorting through things that are weighing them down. That's just being there for a friend. Or maybe they need assistance in the form of an opportunity that we could provide to them. But someone being in need of help is a good time to show compassion. And then just like God shows compassion in the book of Jonah because that's just who he is, we as God's, as God's people should show compassion because that's just who we are. <clears throat> See, God initiates, God sets the tone, God leads the way, God pursues us, but then we follow so these are some reasons why God says he has compassion on the wicked, but for pretty much the same reasons, number two, God has compassion on the religious. See, if you look through the book of Jonah on your own this week, you'll see how everything responds to God. Get this, he commands the storm and it obeys. He directs the fish to swallow Jonah and it does. He sends a message of judgment to the Ninevites and they repent. He commands the plant and it grows. He tells the worm to move and it moves. He directs the hot east wind and it blows. But he tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and he says no. See, if you look at the book from jo of Jonah from Jonah's perspective, he's the only righteous one. He ends up on a ship of pagan sailors who worship false idols. But he knows that he's a Hebrew who fears the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. He goes to Nineveh, which is full of cruel and unrighteous people, but he knows that he is a righteous prophet of God. And then God shows mercy to Nineveh instead of destroying them, and Jonah can't believe it, and he judges God's action to be a great evil. You can almost hear his inner dialogue. You know, that this is not how it's supposed to be, God. You're supposed to show your favor to Israel. Those are your chosen people. You need to straighten up, God. See, from the perspective of Jonah the prophet, he's the only righteous one, maybe even more righteous than God. But can you see the irony? See, if, you're, if you read the book of Jonah, you find actually Jonah is the one who is the most lost, and he's completely unaware of it. The sailors respond to God, the Ninevites respond to God, but Jonah is stubborn and disobedient. He runs from God in chapter 1 somehow finds a way to repent without actually naming anything he did wrong in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he preaches to Nineveh, but he intentionally sabotages it by preaching a five-word sermon that doesn't give any hope or information about what to do in response. And then when God actually uses that to change people's hearts and cause a massive revival in Nineveh, Jonah is so blindingly furious at being undermined by God in chapter 4 
and at God's pardoning of Nineveh, that he would rather die than see this kind of shameful thing continue. And so who does God have to show, who does God have to do the most work to show compassion to? It's Jonah. Um, Let me just pull this out for a second. It says that God forgave Nineveh and relented of the disaster that he was going to do to them. Here's what Jonah does. He gets offended, says that Jonah was greatly displeased. He starts complaining. He lodges his complaint with God. I know what kind of God you are. You're merciful and compassionate. You don't stick up for it where, where, where you need to. Just punish the sinners, right? And he's angry. And then in verse 5, it says that he walks off in a huff. Jonah went out of the city. He folds his arm, makes a shelter for himself, gets out a chair, sits down, crosses his legs, and it says at the end of verse 5, he waited to see what might become of the city. This is where Jonah's at. This is where Jonah's at, just sitting outside of the city, still believing that he is the only righteous one, still believing that he knows best. God God is working in Nineveh. God is calling those who know themselves to have need of him. Where's Jonah? Is he moving towards God? He's sitting in his chair outside of the city, And to him, he thinks that he's the only righteous one. The reality is, in the book of Jonah, Jonah is the one who is the most lost. The danger is that he has no idea that that's where he's at. Here's what God does in response. Out of his compassion and his graciousness towards a sinner like Jonah. Here's what what God does. First, he he gives grace in verse 6. The Lord appoints a plant, and it springs up over Jonah. It says, God appointed the plant and and made it come over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Look at the change in Jonah, right? He begins the chapter greatly displeased. Where is he right now? exceedingly glad. You know, the the plant is coming up over Jonah. He's in shade. God is taking care of him. You know what Jonah's probably thinking right now? I knew God would come around. I knew he would see it my way. See, he's blessing me. I'm just glad that, you know, I was right. God is rewarding me for my righteousness right now. And so he's sitting down and he's exceedingly glad. And then out of God's compassion and his grace towards Jonah, he disciplines him. Verse 7, but when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so it withered. And then also out of his compassion, he gives uh, discipline. Verse 8, when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die. And so here's this conversation that God is having with Jonah, this ridiculous sunburnt man. And he reasons with Jonah. He says in verse 9, do you do well to be angry with the plant? This is like the, 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 the counselor's opening question, you know, just drawing him. And Jonah says, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough even to die. Like, he's just so beyond reason. He's he's just digging in. And God doesn't give up on Jonah. God continues to pursue him. And so out of his love and compassion, God rebukes him. And he says in verse 10 and 11, 
You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? See, Jonah thinks that he is the righteous one, but actually he is the one that needs God's compassion the most. Jesus told stories about this, how religious people who think that they're righteous often find themselves further from God than the wicked people who respond to him. He told lots of these stories, actually, but uh, I'll just pick two. Um, so in Luke chapter 18, there's a story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So it starts with, there's two people who go to the temple to pray in the middle of the day. Uh, one is the upstanding religious guy, and, and the other is, is this guy who is into a lot of bad stuff, kind of dirty money and that sort of thing. And God looks at, or, or sorry, the, this Pharisee, this upstanding person, looks at the tax collector, and he prays kind of a humble-sounding prayer. God, thank you, right? He doesn't seem proud. God, thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. Thank you that I'm not into all of these things. Thank you that I, I, I tithe. Thank you that I'm a, I'm a good moral, moral guy. You know, if you, if you encountered this guy just in, in, in life, you wouldn't think this is a proud guy. You would think, this is someone I would want to mentor me. And so he prays, God, thank you that I'm not this way. And then Jesus, in his story, cuts over to the tax collector. The tax collector knows that he is a sinner. He knows that he's not righteous before God. It says that the, the guy puts his head down and pray, can't even look up. Puts his head down, down and prays. And all he can say is, God, forgive me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, Jesus says something really interesting he says at the end of that, that the tax collector went home righteous before God, but not the Pharisee, right? Like we would celebrate if, if Jesus said, yeah, even the tax collector could be forgiven, but the Pharisee did not go righteous, go home righteous before God. And Jesus says, because he trusted in, him, in himself that he was righteous, one more. Let me read um, just from uh, Luke chapter 15. I'll, I'll just kind of reference it for you. Uh, there's a story of the prodigal sons. Um, and yeah, there's two of them, not just one prodigal son. There's, um, there's a, in this story, there's a guy who comes to his dad and says, Dad, I want uh, my inheritance right now, which is the money that the son would receive once his father died. Um, he says, I want that right now. I, I want to take my share. And so um, instead of rebuking him, the father says, okay, gives him his share of the inheritance. And the son goes out and he wastes all of that inheritance. He gets involved in you know, going and hitting the bars and uh, hanging out with sketchy company and doing things that he shouldn't. And finally, at the end, he just wastes all of his money and all of the money is gone. And he's left sort of out on the street um, only able to eat kind of whatever slop is available. And he says to himself, I, I, would be, I would be better off as a slave in my father's house than where I'm at right now. He says, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good enough to be my father's son, but maybe I can, I can be a slave. And so he, it says that he starts walking home and he's talking to himself about this kind of speech that he's going give to give to his dad. You know, I'm not... I'm not, no longer good enough to be your son, but I'm, you know, maybe I could be your servant and, and work for you. It says that he walks towards his father house, father's house, and a long way off in the distance, his father is standing there looking out, and his dad sees him. And then he runs to him. And then he puts his arms around him. And then he, he puts a robe on him, 
and he brings him home and he uh, slaughters the, the fattened calf, the best of, of what he's got. And he throws a party for him to celebrate and he welcomes his son home, not as a servant, but as a son. And while that's happening, the older son walks out of the party, out of the celebration of God's forgiveness, goes out into the distance. Who does he sound like? He sounds like Jonah. The father has to leave the party to come and talk to his older son. And the older son is furious. What do you, what, what do you mean doing all of, all of this and forgiving him and letting this go? You've never, you've never slaughtered the fattened calf for me. You've never thrown a party for me. You've never done all of these things for me. I've done everything you've ever asked. And the, the father has to tell the older son, like, look, like your, your, brother, your brother was lost, and now he's found, right? Like, he, he was gone, and now he's back, you know, son. It, it, it's a, we're welcoming him home. And the story that Jesus tells ends without saying how that older brother actually responded. See, the father doesn't have just one son that he loses. He, he has two sons that he loses. The one son he loses to wickedness, and the other son he loses to religion, the sense that I'm good. I've done all the things. God, you owe me. He has two disobedient sons. Who ends the story being out of relationship with the father, with the father reasoning with him on the outside of the community, just like God reasons with Jonah. It's the supposedly upstanding older brother. And according to Jesus, the second one in both stories, the one who trusts in themselves that they are righteous, that person is in the worst position because they don't, even know their need for God. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So Jonah's account stands beside the two stories that Jesus told. On the one hand, there's God's compassion towards the, collect, the tax collector and the prodigal son and the Ninevites. That's God's compassion to the wicked. And then there's God's easier to miss compassion that he offers towards the Pharisee and the older brother and, the ta and, and to Jonah. That's God's compassion on the religious. I think God's compassion to Jonah actually worked out because no one else would have had the details to share of this story except for Jonah. No one else was there to see what happened in the fish or in the desert outside Nineveh, but Jonah did. And Jonah chose to share a story that did not make him look good, but instead it showed how compassionate God was to Nineveh and to him. So, we've seen how God is compassionate to the wicked, like Nineveh. We've seen how God has compassion on the religious, like Jonah. And that should lead us to ask, how has God shown us his compassion? Give me a second. How has God shown us his compassion? And the answer is always through Jesus. In Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, it says this, It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord, and he said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. This is actually Jonah quoting a passage from the time of Moses where God revealed himself to Moses and made known his character. And so in Exodus chapter 34, <coughs> verses 6 to 7, this is how God reveals himself to Moses. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, but forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity 
of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. <clears throat> if you read this thoughtfully and carefully, this passage seems like a Bible contradiction. So how can God both forgive iniquity and transgression and by no means clear the guilty? How does God do both of those things? <clears throat> does God show mercy or does he sentence the guilty? Sometimes it looked to people in the Old Testament like he did one and then he did the other. And so a hundred years after the time of Jonah, the prophet Nahum returned to Nineveh. And at that time, God did not bring a message of compassion. He brought judgment. And he said through Nahum verses one and three, an oracle concerning Nineveh, so Nahum was the second prophet to Nineveh. It says in verse 3, the, slow, the Lord is slow to anger, quoting the same passage, and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. He's referring to the other half of that same passage that Jonah quotes. He literally picks up where Jonah le leaves off. The time of mercy was ended because there was no longer any repentance and the lack of consequences was reinforcing a pattern and the damage of their actions was spreading to others and the cost of their bloodshed couldn't be absorbed by the other nations around them. The time for judgment was at hand. See, God is slow to anger and he is also just. That's God's compassion in the form of consequences. God's grace wouldn't mean anything if God never dealt out justice. He also wouldn't be a good God if he never dealt with evil. So the people of Israel had to wait 1,500 years from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus to see how these two things about God work together. Because here's the truth. We all sin. We all deserve to be under the judgment of God. And so how does God reconcile these two things? How does he, how does he forgive transgression? And how does he at the same time by no means clear the guilty? And so people reading the Old Testament had to ask this question, how do these things work together? And they asked that until the time that Jesus showed up. See, Jesus as God in human form shows us God's compassionate heart. There are many references to Jesus' compassion in the Gospels. He shows compassion on those who are ignorant and need to be taught. He has compassion on the sick and compassion on the hungry and compassion on the repentant. I literally have a list of verses in my notes where Jesus says that he has compassion on people in all these sorts of situations. Why does Jesus have so much compassion on so many people? It's because he's God and that's who God is. But God is also just and that means that he won't clear the guilty. That's the, what the passage that Jonah was quoting says. And so how can God do both? How can he clear the guilty and not clear the guilty? How can God forgive sin and not forgive sin? Does God bounce from mercy to judgment? Does his grace have a limit? How do God's justice and his mercy coexist? That question was answered once and for all on the cross. On the cross, God judged sin and declared guilt for sin. And on the cross, he also poured out mercy and forgave sinners both the wicked and the religious alike. See, on the cross, both the Ninevites and the Jonas find hope. Both the wicked and the religious have their sins paid for. On the cross, the compassion of God is equally poured out on the upstanding, good-looking person as well as on the outcast. If you're here and you feel dirty and shameful and broken and weak, you can be free of feeling all of that today. If you bring your stuff to Jesus because Jesus died for people like you. And if you're here and you just feel like you're doing pretty good because you, you do your prayers and you like to help people out and you've got memory verses, then you can be free of that need to judge your righteousness based on how you look and how you perform. And you can instead receive Jesus' perfect righteousness that he earned for you himself in an act of scandalous grace, which was no less radical when God extended it to you than the, God, the grace that God showed to the Ninevites or that Gordon Wilson gave to his daughter's murderers. The only thing that could possibly keep you from receiving that grace would be if you, like Jonah, um, refused to believe that you were in need of it. 
And so whether you're the person who's got issues that everyone can see, like the Ninevites, or you're the person who seems to have it all together, like Jonah, run to God and ask for his grace and compassion. And together we can take that good news of God's compassion to both the wicked and the religious, and we can carry that message out to our community. Because Jesus is the hope of the nations. He's the hope of Canada. He's the hope of Saskatoon. He's the hope of Evergreen. And he's your hope. He is your only hope. He is your only hope every minute of every day. And if you start there, then you can tell someone else this week that he's their only hope too. And so tell them about Jesus' compassion that he extended to you. Tell them about the hope that only he can give. Tell them that only Jesus could save both the religious and the wicked. And tell them his compassion is for them, just as it is for you. And his compassion is so great towards you. Tell them about who Jesus is and about what he has done. And so the end of the book of Jonah and its picture of God's scandalous grace sends us back to the opening words of the book. If you have realized your need for the grace that only God on the cross could give to you, then these words apply to you just as they did to Jonah all these years ago. Arise and go. Share the hope that you have that only Jesus can give, that only he offers, that we all need. He is so good. So what, what else can we do in response to that but to go? Let me pray. God, thank you that you are merciful and gracious. Thank you that you, you judge sin, but you judge it by dying for us in our place on the cross. Thank you that you are holy and good. And thank you that you're also merciful and compassionate and gracious towards us. Thank you that you have not given up pursuing us just as you did not give up pursuing Jonah. I just pray that you would help us to realize this week our need for you, how in need of your grace each of us is. And God, out of that sense of being forgiven, out of that sense of having been shown compassion, God, I pray that you would send us out with the, with the excitement that comes from having been forgiven. And you would help us to extend that to others to tell people about who you are, what you have done, what you've called us to, the hope that you offer to us. Pray that you'd help us be missionaries out here in Evergreen and the surrounding neighborhoods. And that, God, you would help us to share some small part of who you are in the way that we show compassion because you have shown compassion. Help us to point towards you in all the things that we say and that we do this week. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.